You're listening to Long Reads from the New Statesman, the best of our reported features and essays read aloud. In this episode, by train through Macron's France, from the Channel to the Mediterranean, written by Jeremy Cliff and read by Adrian Bradley. It was first published on newstatesman.com on 12th of March 2022, and in the magazine on 18th of March 2022. It's an early spring day in corcelles sur mer a sleepy fishing port on France's north coast. The channel sparkles in the morning sun, the white smudge of a ferry edging across the horizon towards Le Havre. On the beach, a cluster of middle-aged men in neon sportswear are rigging up their sailboards. It is hard to imagine a scene more remote from the horrors recently unleashed at the other end of the European mainland in Ukraine. But if places have memories, these sands know something of the horrors of war. In 1944, they were Juno Beach, one of five D-Day landing sites where thousands of mostly Canadian troops braved machine gun fire and mines as they stormed ashore. A Sherman tank stands next to the merry-go-round on the seafront. Towering above the beach is an 18-metre-high cross of Lorraine, the two-barred cross used as a symbol by the Free French during the war. The monument marks the spot where, on 14th of June 1944, Charles de Gaulle first put his foot back on the soil of mainland France after years of exile in London. One can trace the story of contemporary France back to this point. From Courcelles, de Gaulle was driven to Bayonne nearby. With characteristic immodesty, he would later recall how, at the sight of me, its inhabitants were overcome by a kind of stupor which exploded into cheers and tears. Other accounts relate a more restrained response. Still, such was the symbolism of the site that he returned to it in 1946 to lay the foundations of Gaulism in a speech calling for a highly centralised constitutional order, a strong and quasi-regal presidency, a weak parliament and an all-encompassing statist emphasis on national stability and independence. This was the vision that he would put into practice when he came to power during the Algerian crisis of 1958, the dawn of the Fifth Republic, and which defines so much about today's France. I've come here in late February, to this place of beginnings, to start a trip through the country before its presidential election, the first round of which is on the 10th of April. My plan, to travel by rail from the Channel to the Mediterranean, was made before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What was conceived as a portrait of a major European country going into a close-fought election campaign has become something else, one of the major European country going into an election campaign against the backdrop of Europe's biggest war since 1945. What does the future hold for the Fifth Republic against this dark international horizon? From the coast I make my way to Caen. It is a genteel place, a regional centre for the high-tech industry, with a perfectly restored old town. The café terraces on Place Saint-Sauveur bustle with Norman bourgeoisie, enjoying their coffees and glasses of beer or Calvados in the sunshine, overlooked by a statue of Louis XIV erected during the Bourbon restoration of the 1820s. Inside the cafes, the TVs are tuned to news channels, showing the bombardment of Kharkiv. The city has long been a stronghold of the moderate right. Its mayor, Joël Bruno, is a centrist in Les Républicains, the mainstream Conservative Party, which means today's rally for the party's presidential candidate, Valérie Pécresse should be an easy gig. Pécresse, in her words, two-thirds Merkel, one-third Thatcher, has been widely considered the right's best chance of dislodging Emmanuel Macron from the Elysee, though she must hold off challenges from Marine Le Pen and Eric Zemmour on the far right to make it to the runoff on the 24th of April. The crowds filing into the city's Congress Centre are mostly grey-haired. Inside, young men in suits shivvy them into place, while a moderator reminds them to respond enthusiastically as they are being watched on social media all over France. There are introductions from Bruno and Hervé Morin, the defence minister during Nicolas Sarkozy's presidency and now president of Normandy. Each of them reeling off well-worn jokes, Morin's We Normans are the ones who civilise the English gets hoots of laughter. But for Pécresse herself, the woman who would be president, there is rather less affection. Energy, energy, we're going to win, bellows the moderator as the music pumps up to announce her arrival. Tricolour flags are waved compliantly. 
Her blonde bob passes through the throng and she materialises on the stage to cheers, but there is little of a warmth directed at Bruno and Morin. This reflects one of the biggest difficulties Picress faces. Whilst the moderate centre-right retains some strongholds at a regional level, it remains weak at the national one, where Macron's combination of pro-European economic liberalism and a broadly Gaullist vision of society, secular, republican, centralised, has that part of the political spectrum locked down. Con voted for him and his centrist La Republique en Marche party in both the 2017 presidential election and the 2019 European election. Another problem becomes clear when Pekras speaks. Her first talking point is, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The campaign, she says, is now a masked ball. Le Pen, she observes correctly, is now trying to hide her old affection for Vladimir Putin. She quotes Zamor, who has called for a French Putin. No, she insists. Mr. Putin is not the victim, but the aggressor. Then sweeping together Le Pen Zamor and the anti-NATO leftist Jean-Luc Mélenchon, she cries, shame on them. There is applause from the moderate burghers of Caen, but it does not go unnoticed that she has not mentioned Macron. And who can blame her? The president's extensive talks with Putin immunise him against claims that he has not tried diplomacy. His support for sanctions and a tough European response immunise him against claims that he's not stood up to Putin. What space does that leave for a would-be French Merkel or Thatcher? Not much. In Con, Pécresse ventures some obvious overtures to the more hardline right. Lock up the louts and keep the hijab out of public life. Marianne doesn't wear a headscarf. But it does not seem to inspire. Over the course of my trip through France, Macron's ratings will steadily rise, as those of Pécresse, until mid-February, a plausible challenger, will slump. Onwards and eastwards to Paris, a two-hour ride on a double-decker train past fields, quiet lanes, apple orchards and old Norman churches that could equally belong in southern English villages. We sweep past the 17th century Chateau de Maison, on a bluff overlooking the twisting Seine, past the troubled Cité at Argentille, past the modernist 1968-era campus of Paris Nanterre University, past the skyscraper cluster of La Défense to the west over the Périphérique motorway and into Saint-Lazare station. If you've not visited Paris for a few years, and remember it as a rather tired and traffic-choked sort of metropolis, then I would recommend a return trip. The transformation of recent years has been remarkable. In 2014, the centre-left Anne Hidalgo was elected mayor, beginning a dynamic administration dedicated to making the city greener and more livable. In 2016, the inner intramuros Paris within the Périphérique was administratively joined with the city's outskirts to form a new Grand Paris, Greater Paris, alongside a flurry of associated infrastructure spending. The election of Macron in 2017 brought a series of liberalising economic reforms that have particularly benefited Paris with its globalised knowledge economy. The result is a city that in dynamism and influence is probably the closest there is today to a capital of Europe. Expanses of boulevard and side streets have been turned over to bicycle lanes. Train stations like Saint-Lazare gleam following renovations. Cranes and building sites everywhere announce the arrival of new high-rises, parks, tramways, campuses and infrastructure, including 200 kilometres of new train lines across the Great Paris region. The city is a good vantage point from which to take in the positives of the Macron years. France's unemployment fell to 7.4% in the last quarter of 2021, its lowest for 13 years. Its economy came through the pandemic astonishingly well, according to the American economist Paul Krugman, and it has enjoyed the strongest recovery of any big European country. The country's startups are thriving. Macron's goal of 25 French digital companies worth $1 billion or more by 2025 was reached in January this year. Its GDP per capita has overtaken that of Britain, and its productivity per hour worked is about a third higher. Meanwhile, a number of long-standing French instincts are becoming more mainstream internationally. From the merits of nuclear power as a low-carbon energy source, to the 35-hour week, and strong European defence, especially in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And yet, even in the booming French capital, there is a gnawing malaise. In 2017, Macron pushed aside the two long-standing political families, Les Républicains on the centre-right and the Parti Socialiste on the centre-left, and remade the landscape of French politics, 
promising a post-ideological, post-historical rupture from the old politics. En Marche was built on a series of intense dialogues with voters and drew half of its candidates from outside politics. Yet, notwithstanding Macron's achievements and the fact he now seems very likely to be the first president to win re-election in two decades, even some sympathisers lament the missed opportunities for greater change. The president, they argue, can be unhelpfully haughty and is over-centralised just as much as his old Fifth Republic predecessors. One person, however intelligent, cannot solve every problem in a nation of almost 70 million, says one establishment insider. This can-do mood is nice in movies, but in reality it helps to delegate. Yet the reflex in government is always, we have to ask the president. If he is re-elected, this has to change. A common argument is that the party is an empty shell, and that Macron's prime ministers and ministers have been too weak. The president, goes for criticism, remains too wedded to the fusion of national romanticism and technocracy proposed by de Gaulle at Bayeux in 1946. Among Macron's erstwhile supporters on the centre-left, these critiques meld with a sense that he has been a president for the rich and has courted right-wing opinion on identity and culture war issues. France remains too fragmented, too politically rigid and too susceptible to introspective gloom. I stopped by the Salon de l'Agriculture, the annual show at the Porte de Versailles that shows off and lobbies for the bounty of the French countryside and dutifully admire some Auvergne cows. Then I head to a demonstration against Russia's war in Ukraine at the Place Saint-Michel. Yellow and blue flags flying as the multinational crowd chants Putin, assassin, Putin, murderer. The contrast between the salon and this demonstration captures the two sides of this election, the local and the global. One rooted in the bread and butter concerns of la France profonde, the other rooted in the dramatic events now reshaping Europe from the other side of the continent. The next morning, February 28th, I meet Bernard Spitz, a founder of a social liberal think tank, Le Grac, and a doyen of the French business establishment. Spitz credits Macron with some successes, such as improvements in German-style technical education. The president's leadership in this international crisis is a positive, he says, but the risk is that important internal topics could be overlooked in this campaign. To improve the relationship between the presidency and the people, will need some changes over the next years. He warns that the relationship between different parts of society has broken down. Part of a problem, in Spitz's view, is the milfoy of subnational layers of government, both too weak and too many to present a serious counterweight to the presidency. What is at stake in their election is not just competence, it is trust. Later the same day, I meet Caroline Florest in Le Marais, Forrest is a former columnist for the satirical weekly Charlie Hebdo, widely known for her left libertarian defences of French secularism. She speaks movingly of the darkest moments in her country's recent history, the murder of eight of her Charlie Hebdo colleagues and four other people by terrorists in 2015, the attacks in Paris and Nice later that year and in 2016, and the decapitation in 2020 of Samuel Paté, a secondary school teacher in a Paris suburb who had shown his pupils Charlie Hebdo cartoons in a class on freedom of speech. Forrest despairs of both the right. She characterises Zamour as an expression of the old hyper-reactionary tradition, exemplified by the writer Charles Maurras, and the left, which she says does too little to stand up to Islamism, or the political instrumentalization of Islam in a fundamentalist way. But she is cautiously positive about Macron, for seeking a universalist middle way with his controversial legislation against separatism, or the moral and societal self-segregation of parts of today's multicultural France. Others I speak to firmly disagree and accuse the president and an overly rigid concept of secularism of contributing to the polarisation. On the bustling Place de Clichy, I meet Shaheen Ballet, a former advisor to Macron, now at the German Council on Foreign Relations, I want to be optimistic, he tells me. But it is a long-run optimism that we can get over these tensions and accept this multi-faith and multicultural society, which means accepting a different definition of universalism from the one we have now. The vision of a country he spells out is attractive and at odds with de Gaulle's bio version of 1946, more pluralist and polycentric. There is a common thread running through these disparate perspectives, that the old model of the Fifth Republic may be reaching its limits. 
Macron is in many ways an impressive leader, but even he cannot overcome his country's divisions, which some in Paris tell me are worse now than in 2017. Is something more radical needed? I think of Michel Rocard, François Mitterrand's Prime Minister, whom I met shortly before his death in 2016. Rocard was a bastion of the so-called second left, a tradition heavily influenced by the 1968 protests, and propounded a more decentralised and intensively democratic vision of a republic. I think too of a radical Pierre Monde France, who opposed de Gaulle's top-down politics in the 1950s and 1960s and influenced the likes of Rocard. For the text version of this article and all our long reads, subscribe to The New Statesman for just £1 a week for 12 weeks using our special podcast offer. Just visit www.newstatesman.com slash podcast offer. If you're enjoying our audio long reads, you might also like the New Statesman's international news podcast, World Review. Twice a week, the international team unpack the most significant stories in world affairs and interview special guests for their unique perspective and expertise. Get better informed with World Review, available wherever you get your podcasts. Proof of France's Paris-centric order could be found in its railway network. The TGV trains radiating out to the country's other big cities are sleek and modern, but those on lesser routes are often not. The service to my next destination, leaving from the Gare de Austerlitz, is a slow country train, dust-caked curtains hanging in grimy windows. As it meanders southwards, I witness a microcosm of some of France's tensions. Excuse me, can you put your mask on? A young man asks. Masks remain obligatory in most indoor spaces. He is addressing an older man of upper-middle-class demeanour, with swept-back silver hair, a goatee, Ralph Lauren jumper and tortoiseshell glasses. Who are you, the police? Snaps the maskless monsieur and returns to his magazine. Valeur Actuelle, a hard-right weekly which is ideologically close to Zemmour. The issue bears the headline, The True Cost of a Great Replacement a reference to a racist conspiracy theory about a deliberate plan to replace white Europeans with migrants. The younger man moves carriage. I get off at Viaison, an old industrial town in central France, perched on the northern side of a valley of the Cher River, a tributary of the Loire. The Paris of a Macron boom feels a long way away. The paint is peeling on the row of houses and shops outside the train station. I wander down the hill to the old Societe Francaise works, a row of brick hangars that used to house an agricultural machinery factory. On a plinth outside stands a 201 tractor, its body a cheerful green and its wheel rims bright yellow. Built in Viaison between 1953 and 1957, the 201 helped to feed the nation in what came to be known as the Trente Glorieuse, the 30-year economic renaissance that followed World War II, During that period, Viaison's population grew from 26,000 to 35,700. But then, from about 1975, that growth went into reverse as industry declined. In 1995, the factory closed. Now it is mostly derelict, apart from one end occupied by an already tired-looking cinema and bowling alley. In 2017, Viaison's population hit a post-war low of 27,900. It typifies what the geographer Christophe Guillet calls la France périphérique, the small and mid-sized towns left behind by the cities. Guillet was hailed as something of an oracle when, in late 2018, peripheral France produced a protest movement of unusual vigour and impact, the Gilets Jaunes. This began as a protest against an increase in diesel tax and gathered momentum over the winter. It was an unideological and leaderless expression of anguish at the growing gap between rising living costs and stagnant incomes, gathering first at roundabouts in provincial towns like Viaison before marching on Paris. That the protests were sparked by fuel costs was no coincidence. The centre of Paris and other major French cities, such as Toulouse, Nantes, Strasbourg and Lyon, many now led by Greens or their political allies such as Hidalgo, are cyclist paradises, 
with ever-improving public transport. The inhabitants of peripheral France, mostly working class, live far from the main employment centres, but also from public transport networks, Guillet tells me by email. The car is therefore essential. Despite valiant attempts to renovate Viaison's riverside centre, 26% of the shops there are vacant. Houses and flats go for €100,000 or less. The new economic activity is on the edge of town, in a cluster of recently built hotels, superstores and US-style chain restaurants. If Viaison has a defining economic raison d'etre today, it's that it sits on a major autoroute junction. Macron learned his lesson from the gilet jaune. The fuel tax increase was cancelled, and in January 2019, the president set off on the great debate, a listening tour designed to reconnect him with ordinary people. Such measures stabilised his presidency and informed Macron's re-election campaign. Last December, he visited Viezon in a trip billed as another attempt to commune with peripheral France, touring the town with its communist mayor, Nicolas Sansou. Together, they visited projects designed to revive the town centre, including a renovation of the old Société Française building as a digital campus. That Viezon has a communist mayor makes it something of a holdout. Many such working-class places, long dominated by the hard left, have in recent years turned to Le Pen's Rassemblement National. The party came first here in the 2019 European elections, took almost 25% in last year's municipal elections and may well obtain an even higher share in the upcoming presidential election. The former members of the Communist Party vote for the RN, says Remy Burion, author of a widely read Viezonitude blog. It's that simple. Le Pen's chances have been dented by her links with Putin, but Russia's war could still help the party by pushing living costs even higher. The cost of living is still relevant, Burion says, especially in Viezon, where the population, let's face it, is worse off than elsewhere. From Viezon, my next train takes me through France's deep centre, the region historically known as the Bourbonnais, ancestral home of a Bourbon royal family. The region and old towns like Nevers and Moulins that I pass through encapsulate the two rival forces of French history. On the one hand, the centrifugal pull of the Paracentric hub, represented by the Bourbon monarchs, supported by their Colberts and Richelieu's, and their statist Republican successes. On the other hand, the centripetal forces, the rebellious bids for autonomy from the provinces and alternative religious and political tendencies. The train wends its way through the big-skied farmland, past wind turbines, horse paddocks and crop hangers, skirting the highlands of the massive central, forested and dotted with villages. It trundles along, passing the occasional derelict station. Guillet had told me that the heavy investment in France's TGVs belies the poor state of the provincial infrastructure. 28% of train stations were closed between 2008 and 2013. The train passes the spa town of Vichy, with its dark memories of Marshal Patin's collaborationist regime. I check the news. Russia is now attacking Mariupol, and refugees are arriving in their thousands in Berlin, my home city. At Lyon, I switch to the TGV, which flies down the flat and industrial valley of the Rhone, the snow-capped Alps to the east. From Avignon and Aon Provence southwards, there is a change in the landscape. Brown roofs give way to orange ones, the landscape turns from green to dry and scrubby. Then the train tilts eastwards and the Mediterranean glistens on the horizon. Marseille, France's second city and biggest port, is a festival of paradoxes and in some respects the country's most dysfunctional conurbation. Its poor northern districts, with their social housing high-rises, have long been cut off from the more charmed seafront neighbourhoods where pleasure boats bob in the March sun. The graffiti-covered estates in the north are still a byword for gang warfare and drug problems. Rubbish is piled on the curbs. Homeless people sleep among piles of blankets and bags. Teenagers on scooters careen the wrong way down one-way streets. Several factors on France's south coast combine to make it a traditional stronghold of the far right. Big city tensions, a large Catholic bourgeoisie, and a sizable population of pieds de noir the white French from Algeria and other parts of colonial North Africa, many of whom settled around Marseille and Nice following the same convulsions that brought de Gaulle to power in 1958. Today, the region is the site of an almighty battle between Zamor, Le Pen and the Republicans over the future of the right. 
Le Pen's personal bastions are in the post-industrial parts of the northern centre, places such as Vierzon. But on 8th of March, her powerful niece, Marion Maréchal, from the party's less economically statist and more socially hardline southern tradition, announced her backing for Zemmour. Within the Republicans, Pécresse's niece-based right-wing arch-rival, Eric Ciotti, is also seen as Zemmour compatible. If Macron wins the election, it may well be from the South that the subsequent grand realignment of the French right will come. Yet to define Marseille only by its problems would be a grave error. It is also a city with verve and a deep history of rebellion, symbolised by the Fort Saint-Jean, built by Louis XIV at the harbour entrance, which reportedly had its cannons facing inwards to subordinate the city rather than out to sea. It has long been a gateway to France for peoples from across the Mediterranean and beyond, including France's old colonial territories. Armenians, Comorians, Italians, Algerians, Moroccans, Tunisians, Malians, Senegalese, as Macron put it on a visit in 2017. Despite the city's socio-economic fault lines, these different groups rub along strikingly well. In Afropean, Notes from Black Europe, the black British author Johnny Pitts writes of his time here. Marseille is a mongrel of a metropolis, and all the things that made other people turn their nose up at it made me feel at home. I'd found a place I could exist in Europe without any questions of belonging. In Paris, Forrest had echoed something of this. Marseille has other problems than Islamism, she had told me. And here the local identity cuts across divides. For decades, Marseille's football club had been a unifying force. But there is also change afoot in the city's politics. In the summer of 2020, the city had been led for 25 years by the establishment conservative Jean-Claude Gordin, whose administrations had been mired in corruption allegations. In municipal elections that July, his designated Le Républicain successor was swept aside in the so-called Marseille Spring. A pluralist bloc led by Michel Rubirola, a local doctor, brought together socialist voices, such as Samia Ghali, a French-Arab tribune of the city's cut-off northern districts, with Greens and Independents, who carried the middle-class parts of the city nearer the sea. Tonight, the rebellious and fraternal city of Marseille has embarked on a path of change, said Rubirola. She had to stand down for health reasons shortly after being elected, but the new administration has gone on to bring in positive policies, from shooting galleries, supervising sites where drug addicts can take drugs safely and get help, to investment in public transport. A symbol of this renewal is the Rue de Aubagne, a narrow street of tall shuttered houses near the city's old port. In 2018, two houses, numbers 63 and 65, collapsed, killing eight people. The tragedy exposed problems of urban decay, corruption and systemic mistrust. Today, the street has been renovated, turned over to pedestrians and bikes, buildings restored and planters dotted along its length. The next steps are being decided by citizens' assemblies. It is not too much of a stretch to ask whether what seems tentatively to be working for Marseille can work for France too. More pluralism, more decentralisation, more layers of identity within a structure that remains unmistakably French. I get a coffee on the Quai de Port and read a book that Spitz gave me back in Paris, The Last Chance Manifesto. It calls for political reform, mid-term legislative elections to keep the president responsive to the electorate, a new balance between the upper Senate and lower National Assembly Houses of Parliament, making the Senate into a voice for the regions and mayors, cutting out the mid-level département to give both regions and mayors greater powers and stronger rules preventing politicians from holding multiple offices. It is a comparatively modest set of demands, short of a radical constitutional overhaul and sixth republic that some want, but a sensible starting point for reform to the top-down order envisioned by de Gaulle in the very different world of post-liberation Normandy. That evening, I find a bar showing Macron's address to the nation on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The president appears from the Elysee in front of Ukrainian, EU and French flags. The consequences of these events will be felt not only in the near term, over the course of the coming weeks, he says. They also signal the start of a new era. The bar is still. Everyone is watching the television in the corner. There is something gaullist about the grandeur and solemnity of the moment. The following day, on the 3rd of March, Macron announces his candidacy for re-election in a sombre letter to the French people, 
published on the websites of a regional daily press. A poll shows a surge in his first round support to 30.5%, compared with 14.5% for Le Pen in second place. Before I leave, I pay a visit to the shore of the Mediterranean. This is, after all, a sea to sea trip. The Plage de Catalan, close to the old port, was once easily accessible only to the better off districts nearby. Now, thanks to new tram and bus routes and cycle lanes, it has been opened up to the poorer north of the city. Marseille's new administration has plans to expand it further. The March sky is bright against the islands in the bay and the broad headland to the north. The Mediterranean slops cool and dark on the shore. Working-class Marseille families picnic on the sand. Tattooed hipsters play volleyball and women in headscarves walk along the promenade. If you were to arrive on this beach, like de Gaulle landing at Courcelles after years away, you would assume that the country was the most integrated and serene society in the world. It is very far from that. But here, where the land meets the sea, there is a glimpse of a better France. With Europe once more confronted by the spectres of war and collapse, these domestic questions matter too. The foundations of a resilient society that holds together in times of fear and adversity. Spitz was right. What counts most in this election is trust. France's collective task now is to shore up that trust, build the cohesion, narrow the divides, to make itself robust for an uncertain new era. By Train Through Macron's France, From the Channel to the Mediterranean, was written by Jeremy Cliff and read by me, Adrian Bradley. For a text version of this and all our long reads, you can subscribe to The New Statesman for just £1 a week for 12 weeks using our special podcast offer. Just visit newstatesman.com slash podcast offer. This has been Long Reads from The New Statesman. This episode was produced by May Robson. The commissioning editor was Melissa Deans and the executive producer was Chris Stone. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to like, subscribe and rate the show. Just search for Long Reads from The New Statesman wherever you get your podcasts.